Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is my privilege to welcome you to Overbrook Presbyterian Church this morning. My name is Adam Hurlson, and I'm one of the ministers here along with the rest of the church. If you're visiting us, we're glad you're here. No matter where you are in life's journey, you're welcome here. If you'd like more information on what we are doing at this church, Carol, our tech captain, is adding a link where you can provide some info in the chat box, and then we can send you some details on the good work of this community. This week, I have been thinking a lot about reunions. My sermon is basically about it. The church is deep in discussions about what it means to gather in person. And then last night, I was able to hug my mom for the first time in 18 months. It was profound. If you haven't cried in the pickup zone at the Philadelphia airport, you should give it a try. It's pretty great. I think it goes without saying that this has been an odd time to be apart for so long and yet to still attempt to be present with each other. Later in our service, we will gather around the communion table where we will reunite even as we are cloistered, as we will unite together as one community, but as a part of God's universal church also gathered around the table. That meal then, is something more than just communion. It's also manna. It is sustenance for the journey. We will get there. I promise we will get there. And so this morning, let us eat, let us drink, and let us worship as we take another step toward reunion. Church, come. Let us worship God. say we have not sinned, we deceive only ourselves. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Forgive us, God, for our small imaginations. Forgive us for thinking that we have it all figured out. Forgive us for failing to notice you when you show up in the most unlikely places. Open our ears 
so that we might hear your most quiet whisper. Open our hearts so that we might notice your spirit blowing through the world. Amen. Beloved of God, hear the truth of the gospel, that the risen Christ has rained mercy upon mercy into our lives, that there is no sin that is bigger and stronger than God's grace. So hear these good words of the gospel. Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Pray with me, please. Lord, open our minds and our hearts to hear your word, to understand it, and to act upon it. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. The scripture this morning is from Matthew chapter 13 verses 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Overbrook. In today's two parable stories, Jesus tells us one about someone who finds something truly spectacular and wants to own it. This person is a pearl merchant someone whose job it is to go from market to market discovering, buying, and selling pearls. But I wonder, what exactly is a pearl, and what makes pearls so valuable? Take a look at your screen. Well, for one thing, you find pearls deep in the ocean, in the very deep cold water, for good ones about 150 feet below the waves. In the ancient times that Jesus lived in, pearl divers would chart out to a special spot, jump in the water, and be pulled into its depths deep down. And they could perhaps find an oyster that might contain a pearl. And that's why pearls are so special and so valuable. Only about one in every 10,000 oysters will ever produce a pearl in its lifetime. So it's there in a marketplace, perhaps, that a pearl merchant was found searching for beautiful pearls. And on this particular day, the merchant saw a pearl so valuable to them that they must have gasped, oh my gosh, how amazing is this pearl? But the pearl was very expensive, a lot more than the other pearls the merchant was used to seeing. What would the merchant do? Well, the merchant went home and they sold everything that they owned, everything. And then they went back to the market to purchase that one beautiful pearl. The merchant gave away everything, but they did have that most beautiful pearl. Huh. I wonder, have you ever wanted something so much that you would give away everything just to have it like the merchant in this story? Maybe you'd give it all away for an object, a thing like a new iPad or iPhone or a toy. Maybe you'd give it all away to achieve something like getting a good mark on a test or getting into the college you want to. But I'm also wondering about something else. How might you be like the beautiful pearl we heard about in this story? I think like pearls, 
you were formed by God to be unique. There is no one on earth who is identical to you. Even if you have a close sibling or even a twin, there is no other person like you, just like there are no identical pearls in the world. But I also think, like the merchant's pricey pearl in this story, that you are so, so very valuable and beloved by God that God would give anything and everything in the world just to have you close by. So perhaps maybe the next time you're feeling a bit tired or dull or unmotivated or not feeling your best, or maybe if you see those qualities in others around you, I wonder if you'll remember that God sees you and me and our church and all the people of God as a beautiful pearl, valuable, unique, worthy, and loved by God. Please pray with me. God who quiets storms to a whisper and hushes the sea's waves, quiet the rumbling noises inside me smooth those sharp edges of my soul and give me peace in stormy times through Jesus who loves me. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Our second scripture reading this morning is 
taken from the Book of Kings. Long ago, Jesuit theologian Pierre Teilhard de Chardin wrote about what he called an omega point. The idea is that as God is drawing all things close to God's own self, they would eventually unite in some sort of final mystic unity by which all things become one in God. And Deschardins wrote this, remain true to yourself, but move ever upward toward greater consciousness and greater love at the summit you will find yourselves united with all those who from every direction have made the same ascent for everything that rises must converge. I'm taken by this language as we continue our talk of mountains. The last two weeks we've been walking up mountains and seeing what we see. And it's at the summit that we find all of those who have made the same ascent. And while we have not yet found that maybe mystic oneness of Deschardins, there are glimmers in our lives. There are small prefigurations of a future unification where we all converge together with the past and with the future, where all our paths intersect in some dramatic and life-changing ways. N nearly 15 years ago, I, I spent the night in Erdman Hall at Princeton Seminary as I prepared to start seminary. And then 15 years later, I would serve the church whose first pastor was Charles Erdman, the namesake of Erdman Hall. Coincidence, sure. But when you believe in the providential hand of God, coincidence is also convergence. It is a glimmer of that omega, of that unity to come. And today in our scripture in 1 Kings, we inspect a convergence. We return back to the scorched mountain of Horeb, where the prophet Moses saw a burning bush and heard the voice of God. But in today's story, Moses is long dead. And a new prophet gathers our attention. Elijah. And he sort of does a reverse Moses. After great deeds, he wanders 40 days and returns to Mount Horeb where he waits for God to speak. So as they speak, let us listen for God's word in this passage. And may we notice all the ways in which this story converges with our lives. Elijah got up and ate and drank. And then he went in strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. God said to him, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now, there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord is not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said again, what are you doing here, Elijah? Church, this is the word of the Lord.
Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, open our hearts and our ears and our minds that we might hear the still voice of your spirit in our ears. May we be comforted by that voice. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock, our strength, our redeemer. Amen. By the time Elijah climbed Mount Horeb, he was well known. Unlike Moses, who served as the shepherd of someone else's flock, Elijah had performed mighty deeds for the people of Israel. And like any good prophet, Elijah was the thorn in the side of power. King Ahab and his wife Jezebel grew to hate Elijah because Elijah threatened the growth of the northern kingdom of Israel. Ahab was smart as a ruler, but faithless. He created alliances through violence and through marriage. And in doing so, he was able to expand the kingdom. He found his match in intelligence and guile in his wife, Jezebel. Jezebel was the Phoenician princess, and she imported gods from the Eastern Mediterranean and encouraged the people to worship them. Elijah and Jezebel were bound to meet. They did. In a dramatic contest, Elijah challenged the priest of Baal, Jezebel's priests, to prove whose God was more powerful. And by the end of the contest, Elijah's sacrifice was blazing and the priests of Baal were fleeing for their lives. Ahab was impressed. But Jezebel was incensed. And she vows to kill Elijah and rounds up a posse to bring him in. And so Elijah flees and hides in a cave, like, like Rashbi, our rabbi from last week, that I told you about. Glimmers everywhere. Everything that rises must converge. And Elijah arrives at the same mountain that Moses climbed. Same mountain where Moses took off his sandals, where his curiosity was stoked and his call was given. Moses was set on his path at this mountain. Moses is not Elijah. Elijah is not new to this game. He is a mid-career prophet. He is not looking for a call. He is looking for some confidence. His faithfulness and his work has created only more insecurity and danger, which happens sometimes, happens too often, really. And on that mountain, he is wondering if any of it is worth it. Or maybe more pointedly, if he is worth it, if he's worthy. Because even after such success, Elijah feels like a fraud. He has internalized so much doubt and anxiety that he can't see past it. And Elijah isn't alone in this. Moses had his doubts too. They were born from his inexperience. Doubts that he could do anything. But Elijah, on the other hand, has doubts that are gained from his experience. Moses got a burning bush a wild moment of fire and life and strangeness that defies all logic. But the burning bush will not do for Elijah. So Elijah needs something different. So he stands at the mouth of the cave on the mountain of Horeb. And he watches and he listens for God. And then the wind came. And God shows up in the rushing wind sometimes. 
In a few weeks, we will celebrate the winds of Pentecost, but God wasn't in the wind. Then came an earthquake. God uses earthquakes too. The earth shakes when Jesus dies, and an earthquake frees the Apostle Paul, but God wasn't in this earthquake. Then fire. Fire is an old favorite of God's. Moses saw God in the fire on this very mountain. God would lead Israel through this desert with a pillar of fire, but God wasn't in this fire either. When the wind died, when the earth stopped shaking, when the fire was nothing but embers, God spoke a word, a word composed of silence, a mystic moment of assurance that sounded something like a whisper, or as the King James puts it, Elijah heard a still, small voice. And then Elijah knew. He wrapped his face just as Moses has hid his face so long ago. And then after some words with God, Elijah walked down the mountain. And there he found Elisha. His friend, his confidant, and his successor. He walked down the mountain, renewed in his mission and ready to pass it on. And in his ears, but mainly just ringing in his heart, was that still small voice. What do you think it said? that voice, what was said that could get Elijah to walk down the mountain back into danger, but also back into relationship, back into the work? I have an idea. But you have to stick with me because I have to tell a long story. And I promise that everything that rises will converge. But the story begins with a person named Paul Roram. And a few weeks back, Professor Paul Roram taught his last church history class at Princeton Seminary. And there are a few things you need to know about Paul Roram. And the first thing you need to know is that showing up in this sermon right now would absolutely horrify him. He is a steely Midwestern Lutheran who wants no attention whatsoever. He would prefer to be left alone to read, translate, and consider Pseudo Dionysius and Hugh of St. Victor. Have any of you ever heard of Pseudo Dionysius or Hugh of St. Victor? Probably not. And that is how Paul Roram likes it. The second thing you should know about Paul Roram is that he once had a big and righteous mustache. He made the mistake of assigning a paper he wrote that had a headshot with this amazing mustache. And I was so impressed by such a beautiful piece of facial hair that I would regularly interrupt our class in Augustine to ask about the mustache. I would say, Dr. Roram, why did you shave it off? It was so beautiful, you know, deeply theological stuff. And he would stare at me slightly amused slightly annoyed, and then completely ignore my ridiculous question and move on. Well, after our class on Augustine ended, after finals had been graded and everyone was leaving for the summer, I went to check my mail for the final time before I left. And in my mailbox was an envelope with no return address. And in the envelope was an old library card of Dr. Paul Roram with his mustache in full glory. No note, just the library card a gift. And here's the other thing you should know about Paul Roram. He once spoke to me and I heard the still small voice of God. 
as many of you know, my older brother, Chad, he died too young. He was 25. And one of the very last conversations I ever had with him was an argument. He was angry at me because I had basically dropped out of college and was wayward in my own way. And my brother wasn't suited for school. He, he loved learning, but school was too regimented for him. So he always struggled. He was angry with me because I didn't struggle at school, but I never tried very hard. Never really took it seriously. And he was mad at me and I was mad at him for being mad at me. Just brother stuff. And then he died. And with that conversation ringing in my ears, I made the commitment to actually try at school. I didn't know how. And part of the reason I didn't ever try was because I was deeply afraid of failing. I, I was afraid to be wrong, to be human. And one of the hard things about going to school is you have to submit to being a student, which means admitting that you need to learn something. And it's always been hard for me to admit that maybe I don't know it all. And eventually, on account of my brother's prodding, I ended up at Princeton Theological Seminary. I was walking the grounds of Charles Erdman. And immediately, I was in over my head. Uh, and all of my insecurities ramped up to this unsustainable level. And I, I put on a persona that was impenetrable, overconfident, when inside, I was terrified. And my very first class was Church History 101. It was taught by none other than Dr. Paul Roram. And the first few weeks of school were awful. They were so hard. I had no idea what anyone was talking about. I pretended I did, but I did not. So I would come to class and pretend like I knew what was going on. And I fell back into these habits of not trying so I could excuse my failing. I would come to church history class and I would sit with like seven other students around a table and Paul Roram would lead the discussion about the Council of Nicaea or something. And I would blather on like I had read the materials when I had not read the materials. And of course, Paul Roram knew I was a fraud and I knew I was a fraud and I knew that he knew that I was a fraud. And I was just waiting for the day when the stalemate would break. And then one day it did. After one class, Paul Roram pulled me aside and gently, but directly in his Midwestern Lutheran way, in almost a whisper, he said, Adam, you can do this work, you know. Talk less, listen more, do the readings. And I was dumbstruck and he saw the fear and the anxiety on my face. And then he pulled me close and said, Adam, you belong here. And I felt like covering my face for surely. This was the voice of God. It felt like I had waited my whole life to hear these words and when I descended the steps of Stuart Hall, my spirit ascended, ready to converge. But the story isn't over. It goes on. Two weeks back, 15 years after Paul Roram pulled me aside, he preached his last chapel sermon at Princeton Theological Seminary. And he chose the parable of the treasure in the field as his text. It's the parable that Eileen read earlier today. It's a curious parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in the field and someone sells everything they have to get it. I've long thought of myself as that traveler walking through a field, hoping that I might find God in the most unlikely place that me, Adam would find God and be able to show everyone else where God resides that I would be happy to stumble over God when I was least expecting it. But this isn't Paul Roram's interpretation. No. He says, you and me, we are not the traveler. 
We are not the ones searching for the kingdom of God. He said, no, you and me, we are the treasure. And it is Christ who sells everything, who gives everything, who sacrifices everything that he might gather you. This is the still small voice that Elijah heard. It's the one that I have heard, the one that many of you have heard, but since it is so often still and so small, it so often needs repeating. You are the treasure. You are worthy. You are precious. You are the thing that God would move heaven and earth to gain. This is the gospel. That you are the one God would sacrifice everything for. Though you may feel inadequate, though you may feel small and insignificant, to God, you are everything. For God, you belong here. And though you may feel like an imposter or a fraud, God is gathering you close. Christ died so that you might be risen up, so that you might rise and ascend to the great convergence where we all might be one by the grace of God. And so we day, today, this day, give all honor and glory to the risen one who is rising us up. Amen.
A few uh, announcements for the good of the church here. Our vigil for racial justice continues. The weather is now beautiful and the witness continues to take on new life with each passing season. And I encourage you to come and be a part of what God is doing to gather us together. 3 p.m. on Thursdays, come and be in community. A second announcement is that Sunday school in May begins next Sunday where learners will encounter the sixth blessing of the Beatitudes. They will hear the term pure in heart and explore what it means to integrate our hearts, minds, and bodies to be a whole human being. Learners will receive a challenge to care for each other because our human hearts are created to love others as God loves us. All ages are welcome to join Anthony and Judy at the link being pasted in the chat room. Now I'd like to invite Kedra Carroll, co-chair of our stewardship committee to talk about Legacy Giving Sunday. Good morning, church family. Today, I just wanted to um, bring everyone's attention to, with it being Legacy Giving Sunday. Just wanted to give the opportunity to provide some information about that. And we will be following up with some information in the newsletter and just to prayerfully think about what it means to give legacy to your to the church. As many of you know, we have had some gifts given to the church prayerfully, and we are very happy about that. So we just want to provide information to you and also just to give thought about legacy giving. Carol's going to share a quick video and hope you enjoy it. Estate planning and making a will is clearly not at the top of anybody's to-do list, but it's critical that these decisions are made and recorded so that your um, intentions are clear. I've pledged and tithed my entire life to my church, but I've never felt like I could do as much as I wanted to. So I felt like by leaving the church in my will, I could give them um, what I wasn't able to give them during my lifetime, and that's really important to me. I trust God and I trust the church to do the right thing with the resources that I leave them. Kedra. The final announcement for today is that the reopening task force has met and the session has voted on a plan to gather together for the next few months. As the number of vaccinated grows and the rates of COVID drop, the task force will continue to meet and assess the needs of the church. The exciting thing in store is that for May, June, and July, we will be holding outdoor services at 8 a.m. in the parking lot of the church for anybody who would like to gather. And these will be in addition to our regular Zoom services at 1030. That means next week, one week from today, if you are itching to see people and sit together and worship with each other, I invite you to come and be present at the church. Additionally, we are beginning to set up opportunities for families and small groups to gather for worship for our 1030 Zoom service outdoors. There are some families that are already beginning to experiment with this idea. And then finally, we, the deacons and our pastoral care team is finding ways to pair some worship buddies for some of our congregants who have been vaccinated but are still hesitant to join large groups of people. As you'll notice, all of these initiatives are designed to provide people with in-person fellowship and community while still trying to secure the health of the whole. An email will be sent to the congregation tomorrow detailing all of this, and we will continue to call all of the folks who don't use email. But this has been the culmination of lots of conversation, prayer, and discernment. A group of faithful people have gathered to try and figure out how we can meet the variety of needs that are present within this church. And for some, those needs are to gather in person. For those others, it's to stay secure in their home. And we as a church are trying to accommodate as many of those needs as we can do with the resources that are available. 
And I'm very grateful for this task force and for their hard work and for their wisdom as we continue to try and create opportunities and strategies for making sure that the church meets the needs of this congregation. So thank you to everybody. If you have questions that aren't answered either by this announcement or by the email tomorrow, I encourage you to call me or email me or Eileen Wiggins who chaired this community so faithfully. So this is an exciting time. And I look forward to the opportunities where we again can gather with each other, care and love each other and show the world that being the church can be done both apart and together. Now, as we move into a time of prayer, uh, I encourage you to add your prayers to our chat box, prayers of thanksgiving and prayers of need. I will open us in prayer, and then Kitty Kepstis and Judy Williamson will pray, and then I will close us in prayer by lifting up the prayers of the chat room. So let us join our hearts together. Gracious God, pray that you would meet us where we are and that you would draw us to yourself. Where we are, God, is full of need and full of joy. And so receive these prayers of this community as we seek to do your will and seek to be your people. Dear God, thank you not only for your countless blessings, but for the challenges that draw us near to you. Thank you for the hard moments when you gave us the strength to wait out the storm. Help us to walk in your light and live our lives in faith and glory. We pray for hope for a better future. We pray for hope and kindness. Some say that the sky is at its darkest just before the light. Help us to walk in your light and our lives in faith and glory. Thank you to the frontline workers that have given so much up over the past year. Thank you for the vaccines so that we might get our lives back to some kind of normal. Thank you to the members of Overbrook Presbyterian Church for always recognizing and acknowledging social injustices. Please continue to bless the members of this amazing community mm. to help, help keep them safe and healthy. My family and I are so grateful to be back at Overbrook after being gone mm. for so many years. We love this church and it is the most loving and mission-driven one we have ever attended. Thank you, God, for this place and these wonderful people that have always been like family. Please continue to bless us all that we may be able to be together again soon. I am grateful for a church that has always, always offered us the opportunity to give back to the community and show your love in so many ways since the first day we started attending in 2008. I am very much looking forward to having Women's Dining Circle and gathering together with everyone soon. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Dear Heavenly God. Dear Heavenly God, creator of the whole world and universe, thank you for your amazing, wondrous love. May we humbly offer prayers of intercession this morning for all those in your wide world needing intercession for love, justice, peace, healing, and mercy. The prayers I am about to read are from a previous Overbrook Lenten worship program. Please join me in prayer. God of love, hear the cry of those who yearn for love. Fractured families, broken homes, neglected, unwanted alone. God of love, hear our prayer. God of justice, hear the cry of those who yearn for justice, persecuted and oppressed, exploited, ill-treated, broken. God of justice, hear our prayer. God of peace, hear the cry of those who yearn for peace in battle zones and broken states, frightened, fearful, anxious. God of peace, hear our prayer. God of healing, hear the cry of those who yearn for healing, physical and spiritual hurting, weakened, depressed. God of healing, hear our prayer. 
God of mercy. Hear the cry of those who yearn for mercy, convicted, in need of your grace, contrite, humble, bow down. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Amen. We lift to you, O oh God, the prayers of this community. We pray for Doris Dopkin, who will begin chemotherapy in two weeks. As she recovers from surgery and is finding, finding healing to be a slow process. God, be present with her. Comfort her in this time of healing and give her strength for the journey. We pray for Jim McKee as he battles cancer. God, give him strength and energy. Give him a sense of purpose and comfort him in this time of need. We give... We ask, oh God, for prayers and for help with those who are experiencing depression. Pray, oh God, that you would be a source of comfort, a source of purpose, and a source of love for whom, though, for whom the world is especially difficult at this time. God, be present for those who feel hopeless. We lift up prayers for those who are starting new jobs after COVID. God, may these opportunities bring energy and purpose as those find work. We give thanks for the safe arrival of Gaga and Papa, Diane and Patrick, as they arrived from California last night. It's been a long time, but we give you thanks, oh God, for reunions. We lift to you, oh God, Gordon who died on Thursday. Pray that he might find peace and respite from his anger in this next journey and that his family can find comfort. God, receive Gordon into your loving arms. We lift up the birthdays of Spencer and Adam Shaw and the early birthdays this week of Gail Karcher, Patricia Ogundele, and Andrea McGee. God, we give thanks for these saints and for their good work. We are blessed to count them as community. We continue to pray for Stephanie and her family. God, give them strength, give them clarity, and give them a sense of your presence, comforting them in need. We lift up prayers for Beulah's grandson and his family as they embark on their new venture. God, may your mercy cover them, and may they travel well. We lift up prayers for those who, don't not, who do not yet know when they will return to work. God, may opportunity come and come quickly. And may they find opportunity where they least expect it. We lift to you, oh God, prayers for India, for those who are sick, for the crisis that is taxing all sectors of their country. God, for our sisters and brothers, for our siblings in India. We pray for mercy and grace. We pray for care that would come from the four corners of this world to meet them. We pray for Brazil, who likewise are suffering, O oh God. God, our call to love a neighbor is not bound by proximity. May we find ways to love our neighbors throughout the world. We pray prayers of thanksgiving for an in-person visit this week with Laura Toy. We pray that you would bless Laura in this time. We lift up continued prayers for Becky's mom, Susan, who is struggling right now. We ask, oh God, that you would give them strength, that you would give Susan peace in her heart, and that answers might arrive from the doctor. We pray for Patty Murphy and Jesse Pincus, who are recovering from back surgery. God bless them with uh, a sense of purpose as they continue to recover, and may their pain be alleviated. We lift up Haley, a college student who is about to graduate from college and begin service in the Army, and pray that she may be, prote may be protected. We pray that all the college students who are about to take finals, that you would give them clarity of mind and joy in their good work, as well as encouragement and peace when they feel anxious. 
We pray for Nepal, which is suffering terribly from COVID. God, may your mercy extend into all corners of Nepal, and may aid come swiftly. God, you are father and mother to us. You are our strength and our shield. And so we pray this day in the words you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, as the beloved of God, hear the good news that the peace of Christ extends to you in a time of anxiety. The peace of Christ be with you. Church, God's goodness reigns down on us. In this time of giving, I encourage you to give as you are able.
Gracious one, bless these gifts. May they speak to the world of our faith. May they be the still small voice that someone needs to hear. Amen. Church, as we move into the time of communion this morning, I encourage you to grab something to eat and drink, something that is from your refrigerator or from your tap. It doesn't need to be something special. Indeed, if it's not, all the better. For God's grace and God's goodness is like the flowing water. And God takes anything we have and makes it special. And so I encourage you to come and find unity with God and with God's church. I encourage you to come and eat and be nourished so that we might do the work of justice that makes sure that all have access to the tables that surround us. Let no one obstruct you from coming to God's table, for this is Christ's table. Christ is host. And by God's good grace, we are permitted to come because Christ has invited us. Let us pray. Loving God, you hovered over the waters at the beginning. You flung the stars into the heavens. You, creator God, are responsible for our world and everything in it for the faraway suns glowing in our night sky, for the lilies and the irises that are growing around us, for the pollen that falls from the trees, from the small leaves that sprout from the trees. This is all your work. The love that we share at our tables, the grace that we give to our enemies, the compassion that we shower on the needy. This is your work. You have made us you blessed us with reason, with creativity, with love and compassion. We are your work, O oh God. And though we haven't always lived up to your call, you have always been faithful in your mercy, for your mercy never fails. And when all seemed lost, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, so that we might know the true nature of love. We cannot escape the terrors that surround us. But we have seen the empty tomb. We have heard the song of redemption. Christ was resurrected so that all might taste the bread of heaven and drink from the true vine. Indeed, Christ is the first fruits of the glory we all will experience. In Christ, we have been made into a new people born of water and spirit. Therefore, as we eat this bread and drink this cup, may it nourish us for the journey ahead. May the Holy Spirit bless this meal so that all who eat might know the grace and power of your love. And in the breaking of the bread, May we see you, Christ, our host, who calls us to hunger no more. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen. In this Easter season, we tell a different story about a time that Christ ate with his disciples. See, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus walked alongside his disciples, and they have a long conversation about the recent days, the death of Christ, the empty tomb, all of it. And then the disciples asked the stranger to dinner at the table. Now, listen to the verbs that are given. The stranger took the bread. He gave thanks and broke it, gave it to them. And in the breaking of the bread, their eyes were opened and they saw the resurrected Christ. In the eating and in the drinking, they saw Christ among them. So friends, we break this bread so that our eyes might be opened, so that we might remember the body of Christ which is broken for us and reshapes our story. And we drink this cup so that our eyes might be open to the need that is around us so that we might remember the blood of Christ, which is shed for us and brings us new life. So come, take and eat. For all things are now ready. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The cup of Christ, the cup of salvation. 
please eat and drink with each other. Let us pray. Holy Triune God, we thank you for this meal that proclaims the peace and healing of the nations. We thank you for this meal where a little is enough to change our lives, where a little is more than enough to feed those whose hearts yearn for communion in community. May this bread and fruit of the vine nourish us so that we may grow in faith and knowledge that in you we are one. Amen. Oh, my God.
Amen. Church, now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the face of the Lord turn toward you and give you peace. May God's favor be upon you for a thousand generations on your family and your children and their children and their children. May God's presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you, for God is with you. In the morning, in the evening, in your coming and in your going, in your weeping and in your rejoicing, God is for you. So, beloved of God, be blessed, be safe, and be at peace until we meet again. Amen. Amen. Amen.